Good morning, folks, and welcome to St. Anna United Church of Christ. Welcome. If you are visiting today, we're so glad to have you. If you want information on our community of faith here, uh, just raise your hand and, and uh, John can give you uh, a bulletin, or a bulletin, a little brochure with more information. But we're so glad that you chose to worship with us today. And we welcome as well Barbara Ellis, um, who is sharing um, her leadership in our worship and choir ministry. Our choir is back after our summer break as well, so we're so glad to have you on. <laughs> this Sunday is Neighbors in Need Sunday. Neighbors in Need is one of the special weeks in the UCC that has a special offering attached to it where the funds uh, gathered together go to support the Justice and Witness Ministries and Ministries to First Nations group as well. A couple of announcements as well. Uh, you will see we have a memorial candle and some flowers from the memorial service for Donna Childress. Um, her memorial service was on Wednesday past. We're grateful to have uh, flowers from those services, but please remember uh, Donna Childress's uh, family in your prayers as they grieve her loss. You will have received, hopefully, a pre-focus group survey as you came to the doors. Many of you, thank you, Kim, for waiting. If many of you filled this out last week, please do not fill a second one out. We have your opinions. Thank you very much. But if you did not fill one out, please pick one up. Uh, fill it out before you leave here and drop it in the basket. And there may be a small number of you that brought it home, hoping to have filled it out at home and return it again this week. If you have forgotten, you are forgiven. It's okay to pick up another one, fill it out, and again, drop it in the basket in the gathering area before you leave. We have a youth information meeting right after this service in the conference room. You will get a calendar of the morning and evening uh, youth programs coming up this fall and um, so make sure you come and gather that information you will hear a little bit about uh, confirmation as well that we're hoping to run again this fall and so we want to have a little bit of time with parents grandparents or guardians if you have youth and children in your life please show up for a very brief meeting uh, to plug into that ministry uh, the mental wellness fair that you have a flyer in your bulletin this week and uh, you will have received so much mailing and communication about this fair we're really excited about this event that's happening on saturday you are invited to be there not only to see the services that our city offers for mental wellness for taking care of yourself but also to support those organizations that go uh, and provide really good work in our city uh, throughout the year as well. So please show up. There's a schedule in there as well. Uh, we want to, to have you there to celebrate kind of the work that we're doing to progress toward becoming a wise for mental health congregation. <clears throat> Next Sunday morning, we will celebrate Autumn Equinox. This is a really special service uh, that includes music and readings, prayers, uh, that celebrates kind of life and faith transitions, the balance of light and dark, and the celebration of the changing seasons. We are having that celebration next Sunday morning. So come be prepared to celebrate in that service. And finally, you hopefully have received mailing this week around our focus groups on Thursday, September 28th. This is a special night where all of us are invited to come together to share our vision, share our mission as a community of faith in this place, St. Andrew United Church of Christ. We need your participation there. And in that mailing, you will have received a group assignment and an arrival time. It's very important that you arrive at the correct time and that you participate in your assigned group. We have got some area pastors coming in to kind of coordinate uh, those groups and facilitate discussion for an hour. And then we have half an hour's time to kind of be together and fellowship together over some refreshments. So please pull out that mailing, for a, a remind yourself of the information there and uh, make sure that you show up at your designated time. Friends, I'm so grateful to be in this place together with you this morning. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here.
Let us rise in body or in spirit. Praise the divine whose splendor is woven into all the earth. What wonders surround us, the anger in all and The beauty of the earth is a balm to the senses. Creation overflows with wisdom, ancient and new. The world, wild with creative energy, is adapted through challenges and change. Precious to each creature, every living thing, love and love. In holy defiance of all that spoils life through shame and destruction, we remember and proclaim together the truth from which we come and by which we hope to live. God saw everything that was created, and indeed,
join with me in our opening prayer. Spirit of life, you created us in your image. You made us to be healers, to be protectors, and to be in deep and abiding relationship with one another and all the earth. Help us to trust in the power of these sacred gifts within us. Enable our resistance to all the friends' life and make us co-creators of justice, joy, and care. Amen. Please be seated. As you've been hearing about our Wise for Mental Health Fair, our Mental Wellness Fair, this is only the beginning of what is a process of looking at what it means to become a Wise for Mental Health Church. And when we first announced that we were thinking about doing that, one of the first people to say to me, I'm so excited that our church is going to do this, was Maggie Simpson. Maggie and John have been visiting St. Andrew regularly for a couple of years now, and how wonderful it was when Maggie then came forward and said, I'd like to share a little bit of my story in worship sometime. And we are thrilled not only to hear from Maggie today, we're thrilled to have Maggie and John a part of our congregation, and I'm thrilled to announce for them, if you haven't heard yet, that they're going to be having their first baby in January. <laughs> Maggie, thanks so much for being here this morning. When Pastor Lord announced the church was working towards the designation of WISE, which stands for Welcoming, Inclusive, Supportive, and Engaged for Mental Health, I felt valued and seen. Mental health awareness is something near and dear to my heart, and I wanted to share my story with you today. In the fall of 2004, I left home to go to college out of state. During my first month away, I made friends, got good grades, and was thriving. Then, seemingly out of the blue, I stopped sleeping and I felt deliriously happy all the time. I knew something wasn't right, so I called my parents and they brought me home. My dad is a family practice doctor and he noticed the telltale signs of mania. He got me an appointment to see a psychiatrist right away. My diagnosis was grim. At just 18 years old, I learned that I have bipolar disorder, type one. This is characterized by feeling manic or up for extended periods of time, perhaps weeks or months, followed by a long depressive or down period. The diagnosis was bad enough, but on top of that, my psychiatrist urged my parents not to tell most people about it due to the stigma around mental illness. Due to this outdated advice, my parents never told my congregation the truth about what was going on with me until many years later. Guilt and shame were my constant companions. I did come out of the mania after a few months, but it was followed by a crippling depression. Over the next eight years, I had three major episodes, each taking a full year to recover from, and several lesser episodes in between. I tried 12 different medications, and I ended up in the psychiatric ward twice for several weeks. <clears throat> I'm actually one of the lucky ones. Due to consistently taking the right medications, getting enough sleep, exercising, eating healthy, and other factors, I'm proud to say that I've been stable for 10 years. However, there are many people with bipolar and other mental illness who aren't so lucky. They deal with periodic episodes, suicidal thoughts, and often struggle just to get through the day. I know there are good people out there who want to help those like me 
but sometimes they're not sure how. To do that, one doesn't have to know everything about every mental illness. All I cared about was that people treat me like a normal person. I still remember the family and friends who went out of their way to talk to me and ask me how I was doing. And I also remember the ones who treated me like I was invisible. By sharing my story, I hope I've given you some insight into what it's like to have a mental illness. I'm not ashamed of my diagnosis, and I'm doing what I can to break the stigma around mental illness, including starting a TikTok channel to speak about my experience. <laughs> I hope to see you at the Mental Wellness Fair on Saturday, September 23rd from 10 to 1. It's going to be a lot of fun. There will be yoga, guided meditation, Tai Chi, chair massage, and music. Thank you for listening and caring about people. And as we move now to a time of greeting one another with the peace of Christ, I want you to stand as you're able, look into someone's eyes and say, you are created in the image of God. You are created in the image of God. Kids, you, Jack, Edie, Carson, no Carson, Emma. Is Ella right here? Oh, she's right here. Everyone is here. People of God, you are all created in the image of God. Have a seat. Are you going to get the microphone? Okay, go get the microphone. You got to hear the words of children adults because therein lies some wisdom and so we've gone to get some amplification all right girl those boots are made for Lennon no, yeah no. here let's get them on let's get it on oh you already made it it's already on okay what have I got in front of me right here a balloon it is a balloon it is a it is a beach ball Ball. It's an earth beach ball. Can you find where you live, Ella? Yes. Can you point to it? We're actually written on there, I think. Yes. You got to have a really good eyesight. There you yes. see? You see Louisville right there? I think they positioned the Ohio River wrong, actually, running through Indianapolis. So there's some, er there's some errors in this. Yes, Jack. Can you see Ohio? Do you know what a city is in Ohio? It doesn't have the states up here, but that's some um, Hamilton. Oh, well, we can't see Hamilton on this particular scale, but we have Cincinnati and Columbus and Cleveland. Those are all cities in Ohio. Yeah. Well, do you know where I'm from? Uh, or where my parents are right now? Yeah. Did I have to guess? Uh, you know. Uh, Turn it around there for a little bit. It's very small. <laughs> Yeah, I'm from Ireland. I'm and in fact, there's a city called Sligo there, and I'm like the Vatican City. The Vatican City is very small too. It's actually not marked on this map. But yeah, I'm from right in there. It's actually the pink dot in Ireland. So it's like the dot of the eye in Sligo. It's very, very small. And you know where JR is today? Where's JR? Evie, do you know where JR is? In Ohio. In Ohio, good guess, but wrong. <laughs> Russia. I don't think he's in Russia. Does anybody, does the choir know where JR is? You hear them? Scotland? Scotland, can you find Scotland in that? It's up close to Ireland, actually. Can you find it? You found it? Oh my gosh. I fi always find these, these oh, maps wait. labeled the weirdest cities. Wick is a tiny little... You know where it is? And it has Aberdeen in the wrong place too. So sometimes you can't trust. Yeah. 
maps, right? Can you find Louisville? Okay, so let's do that. Carson, what have you got? Do you want to have, have Evie find Louisville? It's on this big blue bit right here. What letter does Louisville begin with? L. That's right, you got to raise your L's, right? Here we go, I'm right. <laughs> Okay, you know why I've got uh, an earth beach ball today? Because we are talking about creation. Yeah. And earth. And we're talking about earth and all of creation. Are you a part of creation? Yeah. Yep, yeah. well, okay, well, that's the, that's the end of the lesson. Do you know what God said when he created human beings? It is good. It is good. Can you say it all together? It is, it is good. good. What about uh, tall giraffes and fuzzy squirrels? What did God say? Good. It is good. good. Okay, what about trees that change their leaves in the fall? Good. What did God say? Good. It is good. What about lakes and hills? And good. Say it really loud. It good. Is As a church is to remind people of how good creation is, how good every human being is, because sometimes people don't feel that. And sometimes they don't treat the earth like it is good either, or that it's valuable. But we know it's good because God said, In the beginning, 
When God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness God called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, Let, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let us separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome of the sky. And there was evening and there was morning, the second day. And God said, Let, Let the waters under the sky be gathered together in one, one place, place, and Let, Let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together God called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let, Let the earth put forth vegetation, vegetation plants, plants in the sea, sea and fruit and trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the sea in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants, healing seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it, and God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, Let, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, Let, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth, across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind, with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill, fill the waters in the seas, and, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let, let the, the earth, earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle, and creeping things, and, and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind, and the cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our own image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in God's own image. In the image of God was the human being created. Male and female, 
God created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be ye fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has its breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that was made. And indeed, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day God finished the work which God had done, and on the seventh day rested from all the work which God had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work which God had done in creation. May we hear the still speaking God in these words. And God saw that it was good, all of it. God saw that it was good. God called all of creation good. At the end of the sixth day, God saw everything that God had made, and indeed, it was very good. Creation came forth from God and was very good. It's not too hard for us to remember that creation is good when we're watching a beautiful sunset, or when we're hiking in the mountains, or when we're standing on the shore of the ocean, or when a deer runs through our backyard, or when we look at animals while visiting a zoo or going to an aquarium, or when we gaze into the eyes of a puppy, or when we watch the leaves change color, or see flowers begin to bloom, or when we look upon someone whom we love. But it's a bit more difficult to sing in our hearts the beauty of creation when we're sitting in traffic or when we're hauled up inside our houses and offices working long, hard hours or when we hear news of yet more wildfires and hurricanes or when we're sitting on our back deck getting eaten alive by mosquitoes, or when a snake or a mouse sneaks into our house, or when we're looking at someone who we don't like, or we're talking to someone who we find annoying. And so when we talk about the environment, about creation, I think it's probably hard to care about it on a daily basis because it's hard to look at the world every day through God's eyes of, it is good. And yet, it was God who said, it is good. And so each part of creation that God names as good is truly a way of saying, it is holy, it is sacred, each part. Most of the early church fathers, like Augustine, for example, talk about creation coming out of nothing, just poof, out of the air. Here it is, here it is. And that's how most of us learned about creation when we were growing up, that God just made it appear out of nothing. But there are also some early church mothers and fathers, as well as many contemporary teachers, who have teachings that are different than that. One of the things that we learn from Celtic Christianity and from some of the Celtic writings and also from a Catholic bishop from the first century named Irenaeus, one of the things we learn from some of these writers is that many people believed and experienced creation 
as coming from God, not out of nothing, but as literally coming out of God, as a part of God. And therefore, God was seen as part of creation, not separate from creation. Not the old man on the cloud up in heaven gazing upon this separate creation and saying it is good, but creating from within God's self. John Philip Newell is a pastor, Celtic teacher, and author of many, many books on spirituality. Many of you know his name because I've talked about him before. My husband and I spent a week with him on a retreat that he led on the island of Iona off of Scotland during my sabbatical last year. And in fact, as you heard Pastor Emma telling the children that JR is in Scotland, and JR and his husband Alan are actually on that exact same retreat with John Philip Newell right now as we speak. I'm so excited for them. In one of John Philip Newell's books, he offers a view of creation based on the writings of Irenaeus, Bishop of Lyon. He lived from the year 130 to 202, a long time ago. And he taught that the whole of creation flows from the very substance of God. All things carry within them the essence of God. And Irenaeus, that many centuries ago, had concerns about the idea that creation was coming out of nothing which would later become the standard of Western Christianity's approach to creation. Creation would be viewed, he was afraid, not as coming forth from the substance of God, but as fashioned from afar by a distant creator, making things out of nothing from on high. And Irenaeus, in the first century, intuited that this would be a disaster that to neutralize matter, to teach that creation does not come from holy substance, would lead to the abuse of creation. Matter was seen as not holy because it had not come forth from God's being. Rather, it came from nothing. It was essentially devoid of sacred energy. And so he said every imperial mind will have the license to ravage the Earth's resources. It could disparage the rights of creatures and subordinate the physical well-being of its subjects. He passionately taught that the substance of the Earth and its creatures carries within itself the life of the Holy One. God, he said, is both above us all and in us all. And the work of Jesus, he taught, was not to save us from our nature, but to restore us to our nature and to bring us back into relationship with the deepest sound within creation. And he said the Christ story is the universe story. The birth of the, of the divine human child is a revelation, a lifting of the veil to show us that all of life has been conceived by the spirit in the womb of the universe, in the womb of God that everything that has been in the universe carries within the sacredness of God's spirit. And so the earth was created by God and from God is why creation care can become so critical. And so I want to talk about why we are called to work of environmental justice, of creation care. For today, I'm not going to spend time talking about how we care for the earth. That's a longer discussion. It involves lots of education. Many of you are more educated on that than I am. When we think about caring for the environment, there are so, so many issues that come to mind. There are a lot of things that we can do to care for the earth in so many ways. And I'm not going to attempt to cover all of that in one sermon. We have a lot to learn, and for me to address environmental issues in one sermon would be to minimize the issues, because it's huge. But I believe that we do need to be reminded or to be um, introduced for the first time, perhaps, to have the why 
clear in our minds and in our hearts. Because the why can help guide our how. When we have a sense of why we want to care for creation, that helps us figure out in how to do it. John Philip Newell says that what is needed is an awakening to the sacred in people, plants and fish, air, rocks and water. Because if we're awakened to the sacred in all of creation, we will treat it differently and make different priorities. This month is Neighbors in Need, which is a special offering of our United Church of Christ that's been around for many decades. Neighbors in Need, it's a special mission offering that supports <coughs> ministries of justice and compassion in the United States. The Neighbors in Need offering has grants that are awarded to United Church of Christ churches and organizations who are doing justice work in their communities. So that's part of what your offerings support. These grants fund projects whose works might range from direct service to community organizing and advocacy to addressing systemic injustice. And each year for the Neighbors in Need offering, there is a focus. And this year it's environmental justice. The term environmental justice actually came from some of our United Church of Christ leadership in the 1980s, and our denomination has been helping to make a profound difference in caring for God's creation all this time. One of the ways that you can, in fact, learn more about what our own denomination is doing is to get on our UCC website, ucc.org, pretty easy to remember, um, and you can subscribe to one of the UCC newsletters that's specifically about environmental issues. It's called The Pollinator. Isn't that a great name? The Pollinator is the newsletter. And our national offices also offer creation justice webinars. We have a council for climate justice that's involved in policy making. An important part of figuring out our why and learning about the how is staying informed. An important part of the why is also, I believe, to address the issue of politics. Many of the environmental issues are political issues, but that does not mean that they're not religious issues. There are so many issues today that good church people everywhere are insisting are political issues and so they need to stay out of the church. Friends, it's time for us to claim that issues that are political are often religious issues, too. The fact that some become political should not mean that we give up talking about them in church. In fact, most issues were religious issues before they became political issues. And actually, I can't imagine how anyone who is a person of faith can have political views that aren't affected by our religious views. Because the joy that we have in God, the joy we have in our faith, the joy that comes from religion, comes when we look at creation. And so issues of environment are religious issues. Climate control is a political issue, and there are politi political issues around agriculture and forestry too, but just because they're political issues doesn't mean they aren't religious issues. Caring for our earth and all its inhabitants was a religious issue way before it became a political issue. And so yes, the church is a place to talk about it because we're talking about all of the life that poured out of God and how God made it sacred by calling it good in God's eyes. And the story of God asks us to see ourselves as part of creation. The story of creation in the book of Genesis calls us to see all of creation through the eyes of God, to see it as good and sacred. What if we delved more deeply into our religious beliefs when making decisions about environmental justice and care? What if we focus on what we believe religiously about the sacredness of all creation and all of humanity? 
What if when an issue of creation care came up, we decided that we were not going to first look at what our particular political party is saying about it? But what if we decided that instead we were going to approach it from a deep religious concern for creation? And what if we had conversations together about what it means to believe religiously about these issues? And the truth is, in our United Church of Christ, we've been talking about environmental issues for many decades. I'd like to share with you just a couple parts of one of the resolutions that came to General Synod, which is the national gathering of our denomination. This was just two years ago. So just so you can get a sense of how our denomination approaches what may be seen as a political issue, but how they approach it from a religious standpoint. This was a resolution from 2021, and I'm just reading you a couple lines from it. Humans need a dramatic shift from the point of view that the earth and all her resources are available for our soul benefit. That's a religious issue. Nature is not ours for enslavement, but was created as a mutually sustaining ecosystem, which is not to be destroyed or abused. People of faith are stewards of the land in our care. We proclaim publicly the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it, from Psalm 24. And then just a couple more things from that resolution. The earth is an original gift to sustain all life. We are indebted to the leadership and witness of indigenous peoples and the labor of generations of those who have actively been engaged in the conservancy and stewardship of the earth as central to their being. Political? Yes. Religious? Yes. Spiritual? Yes. We need our why so that when we make decisions about how we're going to do things, we know why we're doing it. We need our why so that when we make decisions for our homes, we do so out of a sense of justice for the earth. We need our why so that when we choose how to invest our money, we know why we're doing it that way. We need to be clear about our why we care for the earth when we go to the polls to vote each year. We need to be clear about our why when we make purchases. We need to be clear about our why when we decide on best practices for our church. We need to be clear about our why so that we don't just do things randomly here and there without thinking about why. Why is this a way to care for this sacred creation? We need to be clear about our why when we decide where we're going to give our charitable gifts. We need to be clear about our why when we decide what kind of volunteer work we want to engage in. Everything that has been in the universe carries within itself the sacredness of God's spirit. John Philip Newell's words help me remember my why, and I hope they will help you remember too. He says, we come out of the substance of God, which is to say the human body is sacred. How we handle one another in relationships how we care for the physical needs for those who are hungry, homeless, seeking sanctuary, refuge. These are sacred matters. It is also to say that the stuff of the earth is sacred and how we handle the earth's resources is sacred work. How we handle them with a view toward equity and justice and well-being for every nation, every person. These are sacred matters. Political? 
Some of it is religious and spiritual, most definitely. What does it mean to say that we're made out of God, from the substance of God? It is to say that the wisdom of God is deep within us. It is to say that the creativity of God, something of the creativity that's part of the forever unfolding and expanding universe, is deep within us. Together, let's talk about our why, and then figure out together the how. loving, compassionate one. We are struggling 
It is hard to live into your dreams for us, and our world is not as you taught us to make it. Remind us of the sacred foundations of our being, love of you and love of one another. Turn us towards one another. Nudge us into a life of radical community as we pray for those who need a special measure of healing and comfort this Sunday and in the coming days and weeks. We pray for the family and friends of Donna Childress. We pray for Julia Adidas, who is continuing to recover. For Renee Lage, for Harvey and Judy Johnson, for Allison, Lynn Carey's daughter, for Cheryl Bensing, for Brooks, Julia Adidas' granddaughter, for Eric, Anna Walker's son, <coughs> for Lorraine, and Julianne Jens Horton, and for Jack. For Charmiel's sister and Cheryl Pierce and Nathan Nutz's dad, for Marianne and for Barbara Ball. When we lose focus on love, we are reminded that regular communion with one another and with you wrongs us. So in the silence, we share our concerns for those within this particular community and beyond that have not yet been mentioned. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power Amen. The God of heaven and earth, of all creation, holds each one of us in tender love and care. God is gracious and good, and no one is insignificant in God's eyes. So we respond to everything God is doing in the life of the world by our offering, which we have generously received from a loving God. In the ministry of St. Andrew United Church of Christ, we reach out to all of God's children in tender love and care. Let us pray. O oh God, remind us that even in times of difficulty, we are held in your care by the care of the earth. In gratitude for the trees that help us breathe, for the water that replenishes us, the beauty that revives us, and all the gifts of this enduring creation. We offer our gifts to you today and in the days ahead. Amen.
God looked at everything and said, it is good. It is good. Hear these two lines from our closing hymn again. Great creator, still creating. Show us what we yet may do. Great creator, give us guidance till our goals and yours are one. May it be so as we go from this place to feel the joy of creation that is God's. Let us know our why so that together we can know our next steps as well. Go and share God's love with others. Amen. Amen.